at the neural tangent hierarchy. This is a joint work with HTL. So let me quickly guide you through the setting we use. So we started the fully collected deep neural networks. It has edge hidden layers, and all the intermediate layers has width n. And uh, we use the NTK parameterization. The, we have n training data, and we will use the square loss function. And uh, for simplicity, we only started the gradient flow. So the key insight in many of the recent papers is instead of starting the dynamics in the parameter space, they started the dynamic in the trajectory space. In the trajectory space, the derivative of f is governed by this uh, neural tangent kernel, kt2. But unfortunately, this is not a closed equation because this kt2 it does not, it's not determined by the trajectories, so we cannot directly analyze it. However, the key observations is that if the neural network has infinite width, or the neural network is wide enough, the neural tangent kernel KTK, uh, K, KT2, it doesn't change too much along training. So you can replace it by K0. Then this is a closed system, we can analyze it. It's the same as a kernel regression with uh, the kernel K0. And in the regime, if uh, the width m is uh, bigger than n to the power four, then those people, they can prove the gradient descent for both dynamics, it converges to the global minimizer. So thanks to their results, now we have a pretty clear understanding with those over-parameterized networks. However, as it's mentioned in Simon's talk, as also Professor Arola's talk, they observed that in practice, there is somehow a performance gap between the neural network and the curlow regression. So here's a, big, here's a table from their paper. They observed for convolutional neural network, somehow the performance is four 5% better than the kernel regression with the corresponding kernel. So what are the possible reasons? Maybe one possible reason is because the finite width effect. So if the network is very wide, the change of the kernel KT is small, so it's negligible. But if the width of the network is not very large, then the change of the neural tangent kernel KT is not that small, so it may somehow help the generalization. And the goal of my talk is to understand the finite width correction for the neural tangent kernel. So let's come back to the dynamic of the trajectories. We cannot analyze it because we don't know the neural tangent kernel. However, we can study the dynamic of this kernel just by taking another derivative. It turns out the dynamic of this kernel is governed by a new kernel, which is a threefold tensor. Unfortunately, still we cannot analyze those two equations because we don't know this new kernel. But we can just keep doing this and taking more and more derivatives. We get an infinite hierarchy of equations. And the derivative of the R's kernel is given, governed by the R plus one's kernel, which is an R plus one fold tensor. And we call this the neural tangent hierarchy. But uh, this is uh, simply a bunch of relations, not really useful if we want to analyze them. But somehow we can think that we can approximate this infinite hierarchy by the first p-coupled equations. In other words, we can truncate it at some level p, the truncated uh, neural tangent hierarchy, which is basically we copy the first p minus one equations and simply set the, the derivative of the p's kernel to be zero. And we use the same initial data as a neural network. Um, I want to remark that uh, if P equals two, this is essentially the same as a set that the KT2 does not change a long time, so it becomes a kernel regression corresponding to the infinite width network. And intuitively, if you truncate at a larger level, this will give you a better approximation. And our main result confirms this. So we prove that up to a certain time. So if you ignore the n factors, this is just square root m. And for this term, is, if p is large, it also approaches square root m. So basically, as long as the t is much smaller than square root m, the dynamic of neural network, the L2 distance between the trajectory of a neural network and the truncated neural tangent hierarchy, they are, the error is uh, small. Also, if you look at the, this error, as long as t is much smaller than m, if p is large, the error term, it also goes to zero. So basically, it says if you truncate at a higher level, p is larger, 
or the width of the network M is larger, then this uh, truncated neural tangent hierarchy, it gives a better approximation for longer time. So here's an oversimplified cartoon telling you about what those uh, truncated neural tangent hierarchy is doing. So this is the trajectory of a neural network. So it takes some time skirt M to find the global minimizer. If we only truncate at p equals two, the truncated neural tangent hierarchy, it may only approximate this dynamic up to very short time. But if we truncate it at a higher and a higher level, it may approximate the dynamic of the neural network for longer time. And in some very special case, like if the neural network is extremely wide, then it may not take the network time order skirts M to find the global minimizer. It's possible uh, if we take account of the change of the third kernel KT3, we can show that uh, if the width is bigger than N cube, slightly improve the previous uh, mentioned results, the trajectory of the neural tangent hierarchy for P equals two has the trajectory of the neural network, they uh, are close to each other up to both of them find the global minimizer. But if the width of the network is not very large, we expect it's, more, it's possible that uh, the, if you truncate at p equals two, it, the trajectory diverges with uh, the trajectory of neural network before any of them finds a global minimizer. But if uh, you truncate at a larger level, it may give you the better approximation. Okay. So let me quickly conclude that remark of some possible future works. So we have the finite width deep neural network and also the infinite width one which correspond to the kernel regression. And we introduce a family of dynamics or the truncated neural tangent hierarchy which interpolates the finite width scale, uh, scale and the infinite width uh, regime. And if we go from the left to the right, the optimization is easier because the kernel regression is convex. But if we go from the right to the left, we may somehow expect it will generalize better. So, so one interesting question is to understand if there's a, any generalization guarantee for this truncated neural tangent hierarchy. Will they generalize better if we truncate at a larger level? So if you are interested in my to work, you can find me in the poster session this afternoon. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about our work on deriving lower bounds on adversarial robustness um, using uh, the theory of optimal transport. Uh, this work is going to appear at uh, NeurIPS this year. Uh, this is joint work with my collaborators, uh, Daniel Colina from Penn State and Pratik Mittal from Princeton. So um, since this work uh, is going to talk about adversarial examples, let me uh, you know, quickly give you some uh, brief definitions of adversarial examples. Uh, so consider this really simple classification problem. Here you have uh, two classes. You have, a, you, know, you, you have a speed limit class, and you have, a, uh, you have a stop sign class, and you want to distinguish between these. So you derive some classifier, and then this classifier is able to classify these points correctly. But then, if you consider, uh, yeah, so if you consider these sorts of uh, bounded adversaries, now what's going to happen is uh, you're going to have uh, you're going to have these adversarial examples that appear at uh, at the points where uh, 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 where the ball intersects the boundary, basically. And the question now is. Uh, so if you, if you replace these classifiers, if you, if you replace that, that particular classifier with, uh, with the straight line, now that adversarial example isn't there anymore. So you can, you, you can kind of keep playing this game. Uh, but we, what we want to ask is, uh, when can we argue rigorously about uh, when a classifier exists that can distinguish between uh, adversarially modified points? Uh, so for this, we're going, to st uh, we're going to reason about this using the, uh, using the geometry of the data. So. Uh, the, the way this is going to work is, uh, so here's the space of the data, Here, here's your sample point. Uh, we start defining these, uh, these, uh, these balls, and in the, in, inside the ball we define the cost to be zero, and uh, outside of the ball we define the cost to be one. So it'll become clear soon uh, why we define these costs. Uh, so suppose you have another point, and uh, now you want to go from the first point to the second point. So now the composite cost of going from 
Uh, the first point and the second point uh, is there's a total cost of one because you have to pass through a cost one region. And the, and the reason for that is that there's some region where uh, the cost is not zero, so you know, the adversary has to pay some budget in order to, uh, in order to cross over that region. Uh, but then if you, uh, and if this happens, uh, in this case, some classifier will be able to distinguish uh, in, between, uh, in between these two points. So uh, it may be a very complex classifier if there's lots of data points, but at least some classifier can distinguish it. But what happens when uh, these balls start intersecting? Uh, when these balls start intersecting, uh, it, it becomes, it's, it's very clear to see that uh, in this case, the composite cost is zero, so you can go from one point to the other by paying zero cost, but uh, what this implies is that no classifier can distinguish between these two points, because, th because there's an overlap region, there's going to be at least, uh, at least one of these points is going to be misclassified by any classifier. So, uh, so th this was just a toy example with uh, two points, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe, uh, so I'm going to describe like a discrete data geometry where, uh, uh, you know, where we can see this actually being useful. So, uh, so for discrete, uh, so consider these two uh, discrete distributions. Uh, so they're uh, these two ID distributions on the line. So uh, the the points in green are uh, the points in green are class one, and you have these black points uh, which are in class uh, negative one. So it's a binary classification problem. And without an adversary, the optimal classifier loss is zero. So you can define uh, you know some thresholding based classifier that's going to get zero loss on these. Uh, so now consider an adversary with a budget of 0.55. So you're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to have these balls uh, around the point, and then now, uh, now again, we can ask the question: Okay, what's the optimal loss going to be in the presence of an adversary? So this is not as immediately obvious. Uh, so this this just becomes a little bit harder. So let's get rid of this picture, and uh, we'll move to a picture based uh, based entirely on the cost. So based on the cost, we're going to define this bipartite graph. So all the, uh, and the edges of the graph are basically the composite cost that I had defined in the previous slide. So uh, I've conveniently only marked one edge. Uh, I mean, there are lots of edges of cost one, but I've only, I've only marked the one I'm actually going to use. Uh, and so as an adversary, what you can do is since there are a lot of cost zero edges, uh, what the adversary does is it identifies some of these cost zero edges and it says, okay, I'm going to perform transport along these edges. So in, the, in this particular case, uh, I'm going to pick. Uh, I'm, you know, the adversary is going to pick all of uh, all the edges highlighted uh, with these blue ovals, and uh, the minimum cost. Uh, and so, and f finding uh, ma matching these up is equivalent to finding a minimum uh, minimum weight matching on this graph, and the cost of this matching is one over five. Uh, now, how does this relate to the? Yeah, how does this relate to the loss of the classifier? Uh, it turns out that the loss of the class, so you, you can get uh, six out of these 10 points correct, and it, it turns out that this is the relation between the loss and the, uh, the, loss and the cost. Uh, how, do we get, how, how do we get such a relation? Uh, so it turns out you can get this relation not just for discrete distributions, but for arbitrary distributions, and you can do that through the, th uh, using optimal transport. And uh, basically the idea is, uh, uh, for arbitrary distribution, uh, you can use couplings between distributions to compute the transport cost, and you can use the theory of Cantor-Wish duality to link the classification and transport problems. And this gives us our main theorem, uh, which uh, so the main takeaways from the theorem are that basically you can you can find a lower bound on the loss uh, by computing the cost and uh, just working out this expression and. Uh, since this th this is over all classifiers for any particular family of classifiers, this gives you a lower bound on the loss. Um, and uh, the second thing is that well, th this wouldn't be very interesting if this were just a tautology saying, oh, this is equal to this. But it turns out the quantity on the right can actually be computed in cases of interest. So wh what are some cases of interest? Uh, so we can use this theorem for the, uh, so one simple case is the case of Gaussian data. And for the case of Gaussian data with, uh, uh, with Adversary is bounded within convex balls. We can show that the optimal strategy is to translate the distributions, pair them up. The optimal classifier is uh, a linear classifier, and we can show that the optimal loss has a closed form. And finally, uh, what's quite interesting is that we can uh, we can actually use this theory to uh, argue about the gap between the optimal loss and uh, the robust loss uh, of c current state of the art robustly trained classifiers. So. You can see that uh, you, you can see that for small values of for small perturbation values, there there isn't much gap, and you know uh, state of the art PGT trained classifiers uh, are already achieving somewhat close to the optimal loss. But uh, 
there's a gap for larger beta. So an interesting question is, uh, uh, where, where does this gap arise from, and uh, how do we close uh, this gap? Uh, so if you're, if you're interested, our preprints are available on archive, and I'll also be presenting this work at New Rips. Thank you. Um, hi. Sorry. Um, hi. Um, does this work? Um, I'm Rosemary. I'm a PhD student at Mila uh, in Montreal. Um, I'll be presenting some of our recent work on learning neurocausal models from unknown interventions. Um, this is joint work with mostly people from our lab. Um, Alexa, Anirus, Stefan, Hugo, Chris, and Joshua. It's a long list. Um, okay, so why do I want to learn causal models? So causal models are great for things like robustness, for transfer learning. Um, they could be faster to adapt to a change in distribution. Um, and what is causal induction? Uh, what do people mean when they say causal induction? So causal induction is essentially you're given some data and you want to basically recover the true causal graph that the data has been generated from. Um, the data can come from two sources. Um, so this data can either come, uh, can either be just observational data. So let's say I have a true causal graph. I don't perform interventions on it. I just sample from this graph, and then now I have this observational data. So observational data can also tell us something about what the causal graph is like but I can't identify it under, um, in, in the general case. Um, actually, so given only observational data, you can only distinguish cause, true causal graphs up to a macro equivalence class. So in order to truly identify the causal graph in the general case, you will need interventional data. So basically, most of the time, you will need interventional data. You need to be able to intervene on all possible variables and perform all possible interventions. If you could do that, then you, you're guaranteed that you'll be able to recover the true causal graph, given there are no confounders. We're assuming that everything is observed. Um, so these type of interventions can come in different forms. So you can either have a hard interventions. So I can say, given a variable, I set this variable to a certain value. So this is the equivalent of what um, Perl refers to as the dual operator. Or you can perform a soft intervention. So I can say, well, given a variable, I can change how its parents affect this variable, and I can also change what are the parents, uh, what are the causal parents of this variable. So hard intervention is a particular case of a soft intervention. Um, these interventions, on top of these, these interventions can either be known or unknown. So imagine that you're an agent acting in, the, acting in the world, and you are the only agent in this world, and you have full control over this environment. Then in this case, any interventions that you performed, almost all of the time, you would know what that intervention is, except for very special cases. But in the real world, this is most likely not the case. In the real world, there are other agents, um, and there is the environment. Other agents can also perform interventions in the world, and the, your environment of the world can fundamentally change. In this case, a lot of these interventions are known. I have no idea. I'm an agent. I don't know what interventions other agents have performed. I don't know what those interventions are, but I still want to know what the, what the underlying causal graph is. So how do we do this? And this is referred to um, as unknown interventions. How do we do this? If we don't take into account that some variables have been intervened on, and if we're just trying to learn, this, um, trying to learn the causal graph from all of these data, then I'm, I'm going to get some spurious, I'm going to get some incorrect causal graph because I'm going to get some incorrect causal information. Because essentially, when you've intervened on this variable, then I no longer have this true causal, graph, causal parent of this variable and how it relates to the rest of the graph. So any information that I've learned on the variable that I've intervened on, it's false information. So how do we deal with this? So one way of dealing with this, is we can infer it. So imagine now if, if I have some mechanisms of inferring what variable has been intervened on and what, what intervention it was, then I can handle the situation because I can still learn this true causal graph for all of these other variables, just ignoring the ones that has been intervened on. OK, so now we've dealt with this problem of unknown interventions. What other problems do we have in causal, uh, when, we, uh, when it comes to causal induction? Um, so doing causal induction means basically I have to, uh, if, if I represent everything as a graph, then basically I have most of the work searches through a super exponential subset of all possible graphs. 
So this means that basically given three variables, I have to like search over all possible graphs that can be formed by three variables. And then um, I can say which graph is more likely under this data, and then I will say, okay, this is my graph. But you can see that this scales very poorly of, my, of the number of variable growth, um, both in terms of computation cost and in terms of memory. So in terms of computational cost, like doing a cost of induction as NP-hard. Um, so, but in terms of memory, that also means that we have to store all possible graphs in memory and search through each of them explicitly. Oh, sorry, I think I have to go a bit faster. Um, right, and this is not very efficient if we have a large number of variables. Um, so how do we bypass this? Um, so essentially our work deals with those two problems. We say, if in the real world you are given unknown interventions, I don't know what the interventions are, and I want to perform cost of induction, but then I also don't want to have to search, explicitly search through this um, super exponential set of possible graphs, what do I do? So if you think about this, this problem is very similar to meta learning. So imagine I have my ground truth causal, gra um, causal graph. I can perform interventions on it. Once I've performed interventions on it, now I have a different uh, interventional distribution, which I call transfer distribution. And those transfer distributions are basically just meta samples. Um, so once I had that, okay, this is great, so we have a different setting, how do we actually disentangle learning this large causal graph? How do we disentangle learning all the possible graphs into, um, into something that's more feasible. So what I can do is instead of learning a large gigantic causal graph, I can disentangle learning of a large causal graph into smaller graphs. So I can just say for each variable, I'll only learn what are its parents and how does its parents affect it. So I only, for, so basically instead of learning this gigantic graph, now I disentangle this into learning n variables and, and smaller graphs, which each graph is represents one variable. So this is still great, but then, but then I still have to, each variable, I still have to say what are the possible, uh, sorry, um, what are the possible parent, what are the possible graphs that this variable could have, so what are the possible parents. And this is still exponentially hard, and so we, we said, okay, well, if we, if we don't wanna do this, do we have some way around it? So actually there's a technique that has been used in deep learning for a long time, it's dropout. It's very simple, so now we say, okay, we disentangle the, the parameters of my causal graph into two sets of parameters. I have my functional, I have my structural parameters, so this is a Bernoulli distribution that learns if variable A is the par parent of variable B. And then I have functional par parameters, which basically models how does a variable A is a is parent of variable B, then how does A affect B? So, um, and then basically I can like, um, then my, basically my matter objective is just a pseudo likelihood of all of these smaller models ensemble together. So here's, um, so here's, uh, here's an example of uh, a multivariate categorical distribution. So these are very simple, just over three, uh, three variables, A, B, and C. So now I just, it's very simple, I just have three MLPs. Each MLP takes in all the other variables. Each MLP will try to predict the value of the category of one variable while taking in all the other variables. So A would take in B and C, B would take in C and D, oh sorry, B would take, B would take in A and C, and C would take in A and B. And then all I have to do is, I basically have to learn the dropout probability over each possible input. And this is very, this is, this is easy, this is not hard. Um, so, so great, so we've learned all of this, so we've learned this and said, okay, well now we can possibly learn this causal model, how, but how do we deal with, um, how do, we deal, how do we deal with interventions? How do, how do we deal with adaptations? So we can say, well, now we can disentangle this, these parameters into slow weights and fast weights. Slow weights are the ones where, um, sorry. Slow weights are the ones where, uh, slow weights are, are the weights for my ground truth causal model, but once I perform the intervention, I wanna know what that intervention is, I wanna be able to model those interventions. So these are fast weights that I have within an episode that models the intervention, and then with the slow weights and the fast weight, I will be able to model basically any interventions given a causal graph. So how do we actually perform? Um, so we basically tested our model on two different data sets. One is a synthetic data set that we made up, um, and one is a real world data 
events that which we'll have a look later on. So basically, the model. Um, this, so this is an example, a small example over three variables. Um, this is the uh, number of episodes, and like basically, um, the, these are the cross entropies over the possible edges. So basically, you can see that we've learned uh, the the correct edge uh, edge structures for all of these causal graphs. Um, and then um, we and then we tested our model on these uh, real world data set. This is from the Bayland repository. So this is the ground truth model is the one inside um, is in the middle. And um, so the ones the the graphs to the right are basically how the model learned over time. So the inner data dot is whether or not there's an edge. So red, red means there is an edge between. So this is the um, this, uh, yeah, so red means there's an edge between uh, variable i and variable j. So you can look at um, if for element ij. And uh, the circle, or the square around it means uh, uh, indicates the learned edges. So when the color matches between the inner dot, um, between the inner dots here and the outer square, that means the model has learned the correct, uh, the correct edge or the correct graph. So this is in the beginning of training. Um, this is later in training, and this is much later in training. And as you can see, the model basically could, uh, our model could actually learn the ground truth causal graph. Another thing we want to test is to see if the model of predicting interventions actually matters. So this is the cross entropy over the learned graph, so um, the lower the better. Um, so this is over different times of training. As you can see, if we don't actually predict the intervention, then the model essentially doesn't learn. Um, and sorry, I've gone a bit over time. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll be presenting this poster at the poster session this afternoon. If you're interested, come and talk to me.